in on um, uh, various forms of non-surgical uh, treatment uh, for uh, thyroid disorders and such. I was asked specifically to discuss percutaneous ethanol injection for the treatment of neck lymph node metastases from thyroid cancer. And I am Dr. Victor Burnett from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. I have no financial conflicts to disclose. Here we have an ultrasound of a patient who's undergone surgery for thyroid cancer. This here is a very boring ultrasound. It basically shows a thyroid bed without any significant abnormalities. And I know when patients come for their follow -up surveillance appointments, this is many times the kind of ultrasound that they are hoping they're going to get because there's not much to talk about and it's nice and clean. Uh, on this next one, again, I actually show you the two views. Here we have the view that where your uh, chin would be up here, lower neck here, back of the neck here, and this is the length of the thyroid bed. And then here on the right side is the transverse view are going across the neck with the windpipe here, the blood vessels in the thyroid bed being here. And again, all very unremarkable on what people like to be told. However, Sometimes when we uh, have patients come for uh, evaluation, we end up finding out that there's a lymph node. The diagram I have up here is not to scare you or anything with all these funny Roman numerals and such, but basically is to let you know when doctors think about having lymph nodes in the neck, we actually have different levels. And you can see it's level one through six and the level around about where the thyroid sits is level six. And then down from, from the ear is two, three, four, five's a little bit further back and one's just under the chin. And we use this to help us when we discuss uh, cases amongst ourselves, with myself with the surgeons and such, or interventional radiologists where we're talking about things. And so I think this is just some uh, a, a, a nomenclature or, or things to understand. When your doctor's talking to you, they may say it's in a certain level or something like that, and that's what they're referring to. And here we have a patient who does have presence of a, a nodule in their thyroid bed after surgery. So to orient you here, this top picture shows you the left side of the person's thyroid bed. Their, their windpipe is right there. Their uh, blood vessel is right here. And then you can see the same kind of uh, pictures here with uh, blood flow. And we can see that there's flow in this hypoechoic nodule. It's not really big. It's uh, four or six uh, millimeters in size and such, but it looks like it could be something. And here we see another picture of it with flow. And here you can even see it may have some irregularity coming off the top of it. So this would be something that would have our attention, albeit it's only about six millimeters in total size. But um, we basically um, talk to patients and say, okay, uh, this may uh, need some sort of intervention. Here you see is a map, and we talked about those levels, and this is a map for my institution. It's actually kind of an older map because it's a, a little bit beat up here, but basically you can see our radiology techs and radiology will basically draw out where they're seeing lymph nodes, uh, and so a lot of times if they're small and they're not saying much, they're benign lymph nodes because as Dr. Russell or Dr. Erkin can tell you, the average person's neck has two to 300 lymph nodes in it. And most of them are not going to ever be involved with cancer or anything like that. So sometimes you see in large lymph nodes because somebody had uh, a sinusitis or an upper respiratory infection. And those usually will come and go over time, although some persist for a while. Anyway, so this is another thing we use this kind of mapping to kind of map up what we're talking about on the levels and such, and again, make decision making. So another thing I just wanted to show you real quick, and I, I'm not going to make this too complicated, but how do we even decide if a lymph node is worrisome or not? Well, one, normal lymph nodes are kind of elongated, like what you show right here and thin. Uh, they have something called a hilum in the middle. That's a normal architecture for a lymph node. And then you can see corresponding blood flow through that hilum. And then it tends to be this kind of very homogenous uh, darkness with, you can see here the blood flow, this is a beautifully normal lymph node. So these would be very reassuring to us. And we tell you, yeah, your thyroid globulin or your, if you're a medullary patient, your calcitonin is negative. This is reassuring. We're not necessarily worried about this. On the other hand, if you see a lymph node that's rounded, 
and it's very heterogeneous, meaning you see there's bright spots and dark spots and looks very disorganized. This is gonna get your attention flow on the side. And what I've noticed with the papillary thyroid cancer patients, some of their lymph nodes, they'll have a bright spot like this and you'll see flow in the exact same spot there. That always gets my attention. Sometimes you see cystic changes as well. And then uh, these bright spots may be what we call microcalcifications and they represent some degraded uh, cancer cells also known as somoma bodies where they've almost got calcified dead tumor cells. All right, so why are we even talking about doing uh, ethanol uh, ablation of these lymph nodes? Well, you know surgical excision exists and we can send you to a great surgeon like Dr. Erkin or Dr. Russell and they'll go ahead and uh, potentially remove uh, the lymph nodes when there's a recurrence, but that's not always the best choice for a patient. Radioactive iodine is a great tool, but it can cause dry eyes, dry mouth, and be, uh, it doesn't always handle lymph nodes that get bigger and bigger. It's better for microscopic or very small disease. External beam radiation, more traditional radiation has a lot of side effects to it. Really try not to use that much in thyroid cancer. Systemic therapy is more for thyroid cancer patients. And luckily most thyroid cancer patients don't need this, but that have more extensive disease throughout their body. And TSH can be suppressed by giving thyroid hormone. And many of you, I assume are on thyroid hormone and having your TSH suppressed if you have thyroid cancer, at least to some amount. But there are other options. And one uh, that Mayo Clinic has explored for about 25 years now is injecting alcohol or what we call percutaneous ethanol injection. So putting a needle through the skin into an involved lymph node and using ultrasound to do this and actually destroying the lymph node. Uh, Dr. Russ will talk more about RFA and laser, which is also being used for benign nodules. There's a thought process that some of these might be able to be used in certain circumstances for cancer. But one thing that Dr. Uh, uh, Russell will mention is you have to have a safety zone uh, around these thermal treatments. And that's not always possible when you're talking about an isolated lymph node in the neck and such. So who are we recommending a percutaneous ethanol to? So we have patients, sometimes they're not great surgical candidates. They have significant lung issues. They don't tolerate anesthesia well. They have a lot of underlying medical issues. Maybe they've had multiple surgeries and they're just like, I'm tired of having surgery. Can't I do something else? They're usually not responsive to radioactive iodine. And many times what they need is what we call local control for neck disease. Maybe they don't necessarily have a lot of disease anywhere else, but they have lymph nodes in their neck and we need to do some type of treatment. Here we have a, a case that I'm gonna run you through and I do have a little video to show you live how we do these. This is a, a lymph node that's already been biopsied and been shown to have papillary thyroid cancer in it. Uh, and you can see it measures about 1.1 centimeters uh, and it's pretty uh, well delineated and such. Uh, here's another one and you can see this kind of a regular lymph node and it's got some irregular flow in it there. Uh, this is it, and you can see the needle being inserted, and this could be for a biopsy. This is for the beginning of doing uh, the uh, percutaneous ethanol ablation. And then after here, you're seeing as they inject, you're seeing a lot of distortion and stuff. It's better in the video, so I'm going to skip to the video to show you, get a really an idea of what's going on. So let me orient you here. So we have uh, the neck is here in the front of the skin. This is the node in question that we're trying to treat. We have muscle here, and then we have the uh, jugular vein internal carotid, and then we have this involved lymph node. So if everything works right, we're gonna see this, uh, and you can see the movement of the vessels, and the radiologist is looking at the lymph node, and he's gonna introduce, he's introduced the needle here. You see the needle, and you see this blush of us actually injecting the alcohol into the lymph node. The needle will be moved a little bit. You'll see a blush up here now. We try to march through the lymph node and treat the whole lymph node with the alcohol. And uh, what in this, let's go ahead, that's all on that one. And just comments I'll make is you can immediately see change in vascularity with this. And you can actually see that blushing and change where, where the, it goes from kind of dark to really brightly colored <laughs> is actually some immediate inflammation irritation of the tissue already happening. And then here's another one. This is a larger one here, pretty close to the skin. And let me play this one. 
it's going to be the same kind of thing. We go back and forth. We kind of get our landmarks. Of course, we want to be careful about any blood vessels. You can see the flow, uh, that, that colors that were just so bright. And here you see the ethanol being introduced. This is small. This is point, you know, 0.4 cc's, 0.2 cc's, 0.5 cc's. Uh, usually don't get too much over that. We try, and here you can see now, look at that. You see the flow, that color you saw before, that's all gone. It's already lost its vascularity on that tumor and such. So, um, and I'll just play that one more time. So you'll see here, you're gonna watch out for the color flow when it comes, see how bright that's all flow into the tumor uh, of that lymph node that's all cancer cells primarily. And then again, here's the injection. And then again, marching it through, kind of cogwheeling lower, middle and high, trying to make sure none of it gets out of the, out of the uh, edge of the uh, node. And then you can see that the vascularity is gone. Okay, and let me go. And then later, you see, this is one of those that we just saw and several months later, uh, it's gotten smaller. The thyroid globulin level is coming down. Here we see the other one, it's gotten a lot smaller. It is still there. And uh, we'll see that, uh, the size did go down over two years and such, but that we decided this is the patient's numbers. And basically you can see thyroid glom was up at 3.8. After two treatments, it went to undetectable. There had to be a second treatment of that larger nodule because it was still had some flow in it and it was still large enough. We thought uh, it was best to go ahead and treat it again. And this is several, uh, another like two years out and we can see it's scarred down patient doing well. And this is just some data from our team at Mayo Clinic in Florida. Uh, and basically you can see the volume and this is of various patients with various size. Uh, and some of these were a little bit bigger so we divided them out, but you can see that most of them note a significant decrease in size. Some of them is more modest. Uh, we also like to see what the thyroid glob does, but we never promise that they fully go away or that the thyroid glob will totally normalize. But again, it seems to slow things down and we like it as a tool in certain patients because that uh, we can treat them with multiple treatments of percutaneous ethanol injection, avoid, all, uh, I mean, sorry, avoid radioactive iodine and uh, they seem to tolerate pretty well. What are the pros and cons, advantages? This is cheaper than surgery. It's less invasive. There's no surgical scar, very quick recovery. Disadvantages, there is some transient discomfort, even with lidocaine, you sometimes feel some pressure or discomfort when the injection is occurring. It's usually pretty transient and pretty tolerable. There's some more frequent follow-up. Uh, we usually see it three months afterwards. There's occasionally repeat treatments. And there's really no head-to-head -head outcome in comparison with doing surgical removal. We have been doing this for a long time and do uh, anecdotally have very good responses, but uh, we can't uh, say head to head how it makes a difference. And the final thing is safety. And this is another uh, project we presented at the Endocrine Society. And basically most of the patients we've treated have papillary, some follicular, some medullary thyroid cancer. These are the treatment uh, the sessions and the sites treated. So almost 300 sites treated when we did this poster several years ago. And we've only had a couple of times where the recurrent laryngeal nerve, that's the nerve that goes from your spine by your thyroid bed and into your vocal cords got injured. And uh, we had recovery within one week, one month and three months. And then one person had this a very unusual uh, atosis. So a drooping of the eyelid because there's a nerve that runs by there that got affected and that improved, although it was slightly present at one year. So really low nerve injury rates with this. Of course, this is with an individual, uh, Dr. Paz Fumagali, who's our interventional radiologist who does the bulk of these for us. And so he's extremely good at it. Uh, I've been doing them a long time. And so follow up again, see patients for at three month intervals for a while, we watch the size, the vascular pattern and the thyroid globin trend. And again, this is just showing again ones where they've been treated and what they look like later. And you can see how small it is. And I think I don't want to go any further than that. So that's all the time I have. And I just want to thank Thyka for inviting me and also acknowledge that we work closely as I'm a member of the ATA with Thyka. And again, appreciate the time to speak with you. Um, that was a great presentation, I think. Unless there are any pressing questions. Um, uh, Jen, if, if um, we, I think we could probably save them to the end because there would be some thematic um, 
and um, things that will follow here. So probably the best thing, unless there's a real pressing question, is to have John go ahead and present, um, and uh, and then we can follow up with those uh, those those concerns. Thanks, Mari. And thanks to Thika for the chance to present. Um, I'm John Russell. I'm a head and neck surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital um, and the chief of the division of head and neck endocrine surgery at Johns Hopkins. I also chair the technology committee for the American Head and Neck Surgical Society. And, and really kind of my entire career and, and the things that I hope to do is to find new things that are fun and exciting and can make the morbidity of treating thyroid cancer lower. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about right now, about how we can lower the risk of treating small thyroid cancers. And I do have some slides, but I'm kind of just going to talk here just a little bit. We've got about 15 minutes. One of the fun things about FICA presentations is there's lots of good questions and everybody is, it's a very intelligent crowd that knows a lot of what's going on. So I'm just going to talk just a little bit. I am a consultant for Baxter Scientific and I'm a site PI or uh, an investigator for a locally advanced medullary thyroid cancer trial with Eli Lilly. And then I also do radiofrequency ablation on small cancers. So I, I think the thing, the thing that we have to think about is that there's a lot of things going on right now for small thyroid cancers. And, and I know that a lot of people here on this, on this presentation are going to be, they have cancer, they've had a diagnosis of cancer, and maybe they've got recurrence of cancer. And I will touch on that just a little bit as well. Um, but for somebody who's just actually has a, a new diagnosis of thyroid cancer, and it's a small cancer, usually you have three choices that you're thinking about. And the first choice is, and this is the one that has become very, you know, there's great literature coming out of Japan. Memorial Sloan Kettering has some great literature. And, and most of us think that a really good option for patients with very small and perfectly located tumors is to think about doing something called active surveillance. And that's a, a thing, something where you would follow the patient to see if their cancer grows. Because most people are going to die with their thyroid cancer instead of dying from their thyroid cancer. And so if, if we can find the right patient and the right location of the right cancer, this is a good option of something that you can do. Uh, but it's not necessarily for everybody. But, but the key thing is that that lets us know just how slow growing thyroid cancer is. And, and then of course, we'll talk a little bit about surgery and some of the new ways that we can do thyroid surgery. And then finally, we'll finish up by talking about radiofrequency ablation, which is kind of the newest, the newest and, and the thing that people are talking about a little bit more right now. So the background on active surveillance first, there was a, a really kind of a landmark study, looked at patients in Japan for more than 20 years, more than a thousand patients, and found that less than 10% of them grew, and that only about 10% of patients actually went on to need surgery. Now, of course, there's a lot of difference between Japanese patients and American patients, and there's a lot of differences all across the board, um, but in that patient population, they found that for the right small thyroid cancers, and these were cancers that were smaller than one centimeter, and you, I should point out that the American Thyroid Association, of which we are all members, does not even recommend biopsying cancers that are or tumors that are smaller than one centimeter in North America. And so, you know, this is kind of a very select population that they were studying. But what they found was that for these really small cancers, patients do pretty well, and we probably shouldn't make our patients terrified. Um, what they did find, however, and this is a couple of good graphs from <clears throat> some of their work, was that the likelihood of your cancer growing depended on how old you were. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you were older, your tumor probably wasn't going to grow. Whereas if you were in your 20s, you can see more than half of the patients were going to have their cancer grow. <clears throat> Sorry. And we're going to have, have a need for surgery. And everybody is kind of scattered out in between and the ages in between. And so that, that's an important key. And when there's a lot of these good, really good questions that come from, from FICA members and from patients, I, sometimes we just stop in our conversations and say, hey, I can't paint with a broad stroke and tell you what's going to be the best for you until I know more about your specific situation. Until I do an ultrasound and tell you where your tumor is located, 
I probably can't give you too much information about what you need to do. And so that's kind of one of the key things of what we have to keep in mind with everything that we talk about. And this, this is just a, a demonstration about how convoluted it is to decide whether or not it makes sense. And this is, this is another paper that, you know, really when you look at cost effectiveness data, which doesn't matter more than, it's kind of way down the list of priorities if I'm thinking about me or one of my loved ones. But from a macro level, from a population-based level, we want to know, am I better off to just watch this cancer over a long period of time and then maybe need surgery? Or am I better off just having surgery right now? And most of the time, it's actually more cost-effective just to have a safe surgery early on. But whether or not it's cost-effective, I don't think that should really drive all of our decision-making, at least on a personal level. I think it's part of the equation, but maybe not all of it. Um, okay, Move, moving forward, I think as, as you're talking to Dr. Erkin when you show up his off, in his office or, or Dr. Burnett, or, and, and we're having these conversations about whether or not you should be operated on or whether you're a good candidate for ethanol ablation, there's, this is kind of a diagram that I found that really kind of breaks down who is a good candidate to do some of these fancier techniques. And it's the smaller tumors without any spread anywhere else. When you just have one small tumor, it's completely inside of your thyroid. It's not pushing up against that nerve that moves your voice box, which is such an important nerve. It's not pushing up against anything else that's critical. And these are the questions. This is all what we are thinking about when we talk to you. And so it's kind of for me, active surveillance not operating on your cancer is the best thing for you if you're able to have good follow-up for a long period of time, if you're a little bit older, if your cancer is a long ways away from the nerve that moves your voice box and also a ways away from the capsule, or if you're somebody that's not really healthy enough for surgery. And then finally, the last thing, we always consider patient preference. If you just really don't wanna have surgery, well, then we should talk to you about something that's non-surgical. Um, it might not be our recommendation, but we certainly deserve you at least the courtesy of talking about it. Um, now, surgery is the next option, and that's kind of the, the oldest and, and tried and true, right, for thyroid cancer. And the good thing to know is that with any of the surgeons that you're going to listen to at FICA, any of the high-volume thyroid surgeons, you should expect an excellent outcome. And no, none of us are perfect. And yes, that means complications can happen with anyone. You know, heaven forbid they happen with me, but, but you know, Dr. Erkin will tell you just the best surgeon on the best patient, we are all mortal and we do the very best that we can. But there are things that we can do to make things even safer. <clears throat> I like this diagram because it shows two things that us, your surgeon can do to help you and two things that you can be looking for. And the first thing is you should be looking for a surgeon that does lots of thyroid surgery. And in this paper, high volume thyroid surgeons were defined as surgeons who did more than 100 thyroid surgeries a year. Most of the people that you're, you'll hear speaking at Thyca do that. Um, and so that's the first thing you can do. And you can see the more surgeries I do, the better I get. And that's just kind of common sense. But the other thing that you can do to help lower your risk of complications is to have less surgery when you do have to have surgery. And so if you're able to have just a thyroid lobectomy instead of a total thyroidectomy, the complication rate goes down. And some patients have to have total thyroidectomies. It's just the most appropriate thing for them to have. But for a small thyroid cancer in the right location without concern for spread to the other side or to the lymph nodes, doing less surgery, at least in the short term, lowers your complication rate and is maybe, the, maybe a good option. Now, I'm just going to share, this is, this is a super complicated slide. There are and I'm going to kind of move forward. This, this, okay, this is where I tell you that I'm just going to talk for a minute. And I know that the FICA crowd is a little bit different, especially because most of the people that are, that are here listening in have already had surgery and they have a scar. And in general, those scars heal very well. And so for me to come in and say, hey, we can do surgery without a scar, kind of goes over like a lead balloon, right? <laughs> because you all, most of you already have a scar if, if you're listening on FICA. There is a surgical technique now that, that we do quite often here at Johns Hopkins, and there's many other centers across the United States that are doing it, that is a, a scarless remote access surgery. And, and I'm very careful to not call it minimally invasive because it is not less invasive. However, it is 
in the in the you don't have a scar on your skin that people can see and some surgeons like to use the armpit and other surgeons like to go in through your breast area um, the area that to me makes the most sense kind of from all the data and the one that i have i have adopted here is the scarless transoral or vestibular approach where you go in through the lower lip and you can see why i think this is something we're talking about this patient right here had a scar that actually healed very well but you can see that sometimes people look down. This is a, a heat mapping of the pupils of casual observers looking at these pictures. So if I give you a picture of somebody with a scar on their neck, people look at the scar and it's just kind of common sense, right? And the patient in the middle had a scarless surgery for her thyroid and the patient on the right did not have surgery at all. And so you can see that if you have a scar on your neck, sometimes people look at it and maybe that's fine and maybe it doesn't bother you. And for some people, maybe it bothers them. But the key thing here is patient preference, patient privacy, patient ability to choose. Um, that, that last diagram right there just kind of showed our complication rates. I know Dr. Erkin sees uh, patients that other surgeons have operated on and, and may have a different experience. But uh, for the 400 patients that I have operated on, we have zero patients with a permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and one patient who has a permanent low calcium level. And so is it, is it safe? Well, yeah, every, every surgeon needs to talk to you about what, what they do and how they do it. But at least in my hands, we've been very fortunate with the results that we have. Um, th this is something that I'm actually really excited about, talking about how we can make sur surgery more safe. And this is parathyroid autofluorescence. You can see parathyroid glands, for those of you that have low calcium after surgery, um, parathyroid glands are hard for surgeons to see sometimes. And this, I don't know if you can see on the left-hand side, that diagram, that's a parathyroid gland, just kind of sitting there and hiding in the fat. And, and you can see on the right-hand side, when we use special filters and, and special wavelengths of light, it makes them shine and it makes them easier to protect. And I think that in the future, we are going to be able to do a better job of keeping patients safe by using some of these technologies to help surgeons with the limitations of our own eyes, as good as we like to think that they are. Um, and so, so it's kind of in, in closing, before I talk about radiofrequency ablation a little bit, just kind of, does the patient want, when I see a patient who needs surgery, first I ask, do you want surgery? And if the answer is no, well, then we talk about active surveillance. And the next question is, do you care about having a scar? And if the answer is no, you don't care about a scar, well, then great. I don't have to waste either of our time talking about scarless surgery. And instead, we'll just move on to the traditional surgery. However, if you do care about a scar, well, then let's talk to you about whether or not your tumor is eligible for that. Okay. Um, now, and I'm just going to skip over this because I'm running out of time here. Radiofrequency ablation has been done for more than 20 years. It's been done for more than 100 years. If you go, well, if you go back far enough in some of the early studies that they were looking at in liver, but radiofrequency ablation is an exciting new technique that we are using in the thyroid, especially in the United States over the last three or four years. Um, this is a paper that we worked on with some, some uh, a group in China. And this is, this is another group coming out of South Korea for small thyroid cancers where people do not want to do active surveillance, but they are eligible for active surveillance. This could be an option. And I think it's key to drive home that I don't know that we have any data that this is any safer than active surveillance. So I, I think that my job as a researcher is to tell people, hey, by treating this with radiofrequency ablation, I have hopes that I can make it disappear, but I have zero evidence that we can make this cancer go away. And so instead, what I'm telling you is, if you are safe enough for us to watch this cancer, but you don't want to watch this cancer, well, then we can try radiofrequency ablation and see what results we get, and it may disappear, and it may go away, at least on ultrasound. But we don't know what that means at a cellular level. And there have been good studies that have done biopsies of these same sites afterwards, and they've looked and they've tried to figure out if the cancer is still there. And those results are promising. But I don't, well, I guarantee you that there is nobody that has adequate results to tell you 30 years from now, you will be cancer free if you do radiofrequency ablation. And so I think, I think, yes, this is promising. Yes, I'm ecstatic about radiofrequency ablation. Yes, I've done hundreds of them for scarless, or for, or sorry, for benign cases, and I think it's phenomenal as an option. But for cancers, let's not get too excited, even though I'm super excited. I can't let patients get excited 
about this and we have to talk about all the limitations first. The, and the other key thing is as you do this, and I'm gonna stop, I promise, because I've already gone over my time. But the key thing to realize is your cancer is actually gonna grow for the first six months after you do this procedure. And it's gonna freak every single person out. And then over the next six to 12 months, you're gonna see it shrink and it's gonna to start to come back to zero and hopefully will actually even go away. And that's what, that's what some of the studies have seen. So, uh, but this is of course, incredibly small cancers. You're looking at cancers that are way too small for us to biopsy here in the United States. This is my Venn diagram. I'm sorry I talked so long, but, but I, this is exciting stuff. So thanks for letting me, thanks for letting me share. Great talk, John. Um, we have the pleasure of having Jennifer Holcomb as um, here as a patient advocate, um, who is also a veteran of thyroid radiofrequency ablation herself. Um, let me uh, um, let me see if Jennifer has any comments at this point before I sort of start peppering these guys with my my questions here. I'll just say that um, in the Facebook group that we run for patients with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, we have had a few cases of patients who have had RFA and ethanol ablation on their thyroid cancers, and all of them are happy. So we're very excited to hear and learn more about these procedures and helping patients to avoid surgery if that's possible. Great. So let me, um, let me play a little bit of um, devil's advocate here, and I think that one of the key things here, um, and uh, Vic, um, Dr. Burnett had really uh, mentioned this, um, but patient selection is absolutely critical. And obviously your hands are tied if the patients um, in particular really is not a good candidate to undergo um, surgical intervention and there you're looking for your next best option here. Um, Tell me a little bit about um, histologic findings that would, or cytologic findings that would make you less inclined to use um, either a, a transoral approach for um, doing thyroidectomy or a non-surgical approach, given that all things are equal, uh, to do alcohol ablation or radiofrequency ablation. Um, John, do you want to start off with that? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, certainly medullary thyroid cancer is the first thing that comes to mind. I think what, what we are talking about on this panel is the kind of cancers that we don't think are going to kill a patient, right? And, and that sounds very blunt, and I apologize for being crass, but if it's a small, well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer, then you belong in this conversation. And if, you're, and if you've got a medullary cancer, if you've got a more aggressive type of cancer, poorly differentiated, your doctor is saying that there's maybe a metastasis to your lymph nodes that's involved, we, first, our job is to help you. And we know we have a very high cure rate on those patients with surgery. Um, we, it, it's only on a very narrow band of patients or a very narrow band of pathology, actually quite a few patients, but a narrow band of pathology that we can really kind of innovate to. Vic, do you wanna weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, papillary is what I would be looking for. There might be some more aggressive forms of papillary you're getting a hint of on FNA cytology that you would say, mm, you know, maybe we should go a more traditional thing. The only other thing, and I'll ask actually what Dr. Russell thinks, uh, uh, I mean, there, so papillary spreads by the lymphatic system primarily. Follicular and herthal cell are different types. Uh, you mentioned medullary. I think if I think about it more, a follicular, particularly herthal cell, probably wouldn't be ones I might lean towards as well, just because of the chance of spreading by the blood. What do you think? I think I totally agree with you. I, I think, you know, we've all seen herthal cells and follicular carcinomas that should have been very treatable that we just didn't catch them quite early enough. But I will, and I didn't speak about this because we, we haven't done this directly and it's not really published data, but Rochester, Minnesota Mayo has done ethanol ablation of small intrathyroidal papillary thyroid cancers and had very nice outcomes. Patients came said, I really, really, really don't want surgery. Can you not offer me something? And they've been doing it. I think they're up to 
they might be up to three dozen now. They're up to about two and a half dozen the last I checked, and it's been very promising too. So I think it's, there's definitely a role for it. I mean, we active surveillance is something I definitely believe in, and I think again, those are patients that need to be selected appropriately, as Dr. Erkin referred to. And I think there is a cohort of patients with micro papillary thyroid cancers that would be appropriately managed potentially with percutaneous ethanol or RFA or or some type of uh, uh, treatment like that and forego surgery and potentially can do very well. But I think we need to follow that cohort very closely too. Do any um, uh, specific mutations have an impact on your decision-making? So all, you know, I think uh, the group would uh, admit that or agree that a lot of thyroid cancers look the same by ultrasound, especially when you're talking about this small volume um, early stage disease, but some of them may have um, uh, may be engineered to behave badly over time. So would your ch choice of treatment be altered, even if it says papillary thyroid cancer on your cytology, by specific mutations that um, would steer you away from an, um, or towards an, an, an open procedure? Uh, I'll give my thoughts. Uh, I, I think just even if you look at surgery, there's not definitive data like you using the BRAF mutation, which is one of the more common mutations alone and, and proof that we should be treating people differently. Now, there's some where, you know, they have something called BRAF and TERT and those two together are a little bit more concerning and maybe we are gonna see more data that we should be treating people differently. That's just with surgery. Now we're doing something which is a little bit off uh, from the regular that we do, a little less standardized. And I'd say, you know, if I had the data and knew somebody had a BRAF and TERT mutation, I would probably have a long discussion with them and say, you know, that could be a little bit more uh, concerning. But first of all, we don't usually have that, the, that, that information. And I don't have proof that they couldn't be effectively managed, but I might be worried a little bit more in that particular. And of course, medullary, we're not, we're not putting on the table. So we're not worried about those reputations, but uh, that would be my first thought. So, so, so a couple of things. Uh, for our clinical trial, we are actually if you before we will treat with radiofrequency ablation, we are doing molecular marker testing. And you know the, the key thing, and Vic kind of alluded to this, we don't have prognostic information of, of those markers, right? And so they're good for diagnosing cancers, but we don't know really what it means to have a BRAF mutation in everybody. It's associated sometimes with a more aggressive cancer, but not always. And so it's only when you see combinations of mutations that most patients really have a bad outcome. And so for us, what we're doing, partly so that we can learn through the research prognostically, and partly so that we can say, look, if you show up and you have a BRAF and a TERT promoter mutation, you're out, because that's a bad tumor, even if it's small and you need open surgery. And so for our clinical trial, yes, that is part of it. Um, what, one other thing, and, and this is Mark, I don't, I'd be interested in hearing your comments, but I have operated on a few patients who have had ethanol before, um, and there is not much that I hate more than operating on a, an ethanol ablated neck, um, just because of the fact that it kind of spreads outside of that capsule and really creates lots of scar tissue. I, I'm not saying that it's not the right thing for some small cancers, especially maybe in, within the thyroid like we're talking about. Have you had experience with it, Mark? Have you? I think, I think there probably are a couple of things that I hate more than that, but um, one of them being uh, an anaplastic thyroid cancer patients who have been treated with uh, dubrafenib and trimetinib. Those are really difficult. But yes, there is no question that if somebody fails alcohol ablation, it can be a tricky, uh, tricky operation. Obviously, it all depends where it is in the neck and what's close to it. So... Um, and I, I think that is, uh, does make it challenging. That brings um, up a great, can, can I make a quick point? I yeah. mean, I think there's a difference because we don't really see a lot of that scarring. Now, again, I may be very, uh, you know, uh, blessed and have somebody who's tremendously good at this, but he's very careful about one, seeing if there is any spilling as he's actively doing it. So he's doing a little bit of time. 
the lymph nodes that tend to have a capsule tend to poke into them one time and not disrupt the capsule more than that. And we really have a lot of, a lot of problems with scarring that we know because sometimes these patients have had to have the surgery. But ones that are soft tissue metastases that have no thing, we think about twice about doing those because it's very hard to control those and they, they will leak. So we do, in our group at least, uh, subdivide these out as far as, uh, you know, uh, whether we think they're good uh, candidates for all color. And so Vic, maybe maybe that really makes the point that you need to be going to somebody that knows what they're doing when when you talk to them about that because that one of the the, the hurdle for ethanol ablation is quite low right there's lots of people that can do that or say they can do that yeah but there's a difference if you go to Mayo in Florida or Mayo in in Rochester than if you go to Joe Schmo around the corner who's got a bottle of ethanol you know. So yeah, I think you wanna make sure that the guy doing it hasn't consumed any of the ethanol before they do the <laughs> ethanol ablation. I think that's really important. Um, is this a Friday afternoon comment? Or? <laughs> it, it is actually, um, yeah, no. Um, so having said that, um, Vic, maybe you and um, John can comment just a little bit. So on the topic of radiofrequency ablation, ethanol ablation, what are the absolutely um, what should patients know about absolute non-starters with respect to location um, uh, where this should not be attempted? Yeah, I mean, let's for, let's hone in specifically on on lymph nodes. Yeah, I mean, for for percutaneous ethanol injection, we get nervous if it's anywhere around where we expect the insertion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So there are certain positions uh, when it's really up against the. Uh, trachea and a certain level, my, my interventional radiologist will have a long discussion. Sometimes we'll say no. The other thing is our advice not to do it. Sometimes we've said we just don't feel comfortable doing it. And just to go back, you know, when we talk to our patients about this, a lot of times I say, you know what, you can have surgery or radio or, or the ethanol ablation. And, you know, there's a choice here. I've talked to both my surgeon and to my interventional radiologist. And so these are the risks and benefits. Of course, the surgeon will say, well, that's really close to something I don't want to bump into either. So uh, then sometimes they're both going, well, we, we both of us are options, but there's there's risk. So I think that's one of the biggest. And then the difference in between it being an encapsulated lymph node and being a soft tissue met that may leak more than, uh, especially if it's something like that right around the recurrent laryngeal nerve, we're going to be very nervous about offering. John, do you have any thoughts or comments on that? No, it's it's a it's a team game, right? Like it, the patient is one arm of the team, the surgeon is another arm, and the endocrinologist is the is the other arm. And with these complex decisions, everybody has a say in what happens. And I and I think you're selling yourself short if you haven't engaged with every single member of the team to find out what the best option is. So one of the common themes here is that. Um, Performing non-surgical management eliminates one really, really, really important thing. And that's an opportunity to look at the architecture of the structure that you're ablating, the ability to get it under the microscope, interrogate it, and find out if this is what you think it is or whether it's evolved. And we all know that thyroid, papillary thyroid cancers can change. And those are um, over time. And the assumption being that it's the same disease just coming back over and over again, and let's just, let's just get rid of it so we don't have to see it anymore, um, may not be accurate. And so, you know, there may be changes or subtle clues on FNA, there may be changes on ultrasound that would suggest that, but sometimes you just don't know. So one of the things on a lymph node, um, I just met with a patient who, um, uh, we took out a lymph node that looked fine on ultrasound, but had extra nodal extension. That's going to give us information about that disease that we may not have otherwise had. Now that, that concern goes out the window if you're dealing with somebody who's not a risk to have, who's at great risk to undergo surgery, you know, you, your hands are tied, um, you know, you do what you can. But just comment a little bit on um, you know, the assumption, the basic assumption here that um, all innocent looking nodules or, or recurrent lymph nodes 
are created equal. Yeah, I, that's a great point, Mark. And uh, I mean, so one thing we look very closely at our ultrasounds to see if we there's rattiness around the edges and stuff, but you're right. No matter what we do without having the surgeon go in and really looking at it and have the pathologist inspect it, we can't say if there's external extension or extension outside of that, that lymph node and such. Um, you know, you look at what, how these tumors and lymph nodes, how they've been growing, what has been the behavior. We, of course, we do repeat FNA sometimes on the repeat needle aspirations like, oh, these look even more, you know, disturbed. And when we can, then we can consider about doing more uh, molecular testing and stuff like that, I think is another option. And we watch these patients closely. That's why we have them come back at three months and see, because I think if it's extranodal and it's, it's a bad actor we're going to see it not respond the way that we think it ought to and it's going to get up our red flags and we're going to be looking a lot more closely and then you know they may have to have additional intervention or maybe actually go to surgery so then we backtrack i have to say i haven't seen that a lot and i haven't seen uh, a lot of concerning things like you've mentioned happen um, but uh, it's something we need to continually be on the watch for john do you want to comment on that yeah, uh, you know, really all, I, no, Vic said it well. Okay, wow, okay. Um, let me ask you another thing, John, specifically towards um, transoral um, surgery for removal of thyroid cancers. Um, we all know that thyroid cancers carry a significant risk, even small thyroid cancers of having paratracheal lymph nodes. One of the things that you have um, as a surgeon doing con uh, conventional approaches here is the ability to palpate um, that area directly and your dexterity and your, your, the feedback that you get from palpation may tell you something that your eyes uh, uh, don't tell you about, in particular about the presence of lymph nodes in that area. You know, so we've gone through a whole generation of controversy regarding um, whether um, prophylactic central compartment lymph node dissection should be done or not done. Um, and that pendulum has swung multiple times in many directions. But the reality is that that is something that you don't, um, you cannot get when you're looking through the mouth as opposed to openly feeling with your fingers and saying, you know, this is a firm, this is, it's small, but it's firm. I'm going to send this off for frozen and find out. And if it, do, if it does come back positive, I'm gonna be a little bit concerned that some of the lymph nodes that are hidden within the fat um, of the central compartment, I'm, I'm just not gonna see them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna look much more closely to get those lymph nodes out um, because the biology of this tumor has declared itself. Um, I've sort of set the stage here. So let me hear your thoughts on this because um, that's something that Concerns always concerns me. Um, I, there are countless times that I've been surprised. Um, and obviously just sort of to preface that, um, I'm sure that the pain, well, the patients may not know uh, who are listening, but limp, we do ultrasounds all the time to before we operate. But when the thyroid is in place, it can be very difficult to visualize those central compartment lymph nodes effectively. And so, um, you're losing that feedback and that information that comes from tactile um, uh, palpation of the central compartment. Well, well said, certainly you do lose that. And, and I think the, the question is, uh, there, there was a pretty good paper that kind of put my mind at ease on that, kind of looking at how good surgeons were at palpating nodes in the central neck. And I think the answer was, we're not. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think sometimes we, we at least I give myself credit. I went through a, a brief stretch of thinking that I was finding abnormalities in the central neck. And I, I think I got three in a row that my pathologist told me that they were parathyroid glands. And that was pretty humbling about my, you know, just how good I thought I was. And, and so at this point, you know, with this scarless surgery, yes, we can do central neck dissections. I've been very pleased with our results. I think maybe I, I give up some haptic feedback, that tactile feedback but I trade it in for a really excellent magnified view of the structures that I see as I get in there. 
Um, and if there's something abnormal, then you have to make that decision every single time. Is this worth sending to a pathologist? Um, is it abnormal enough? Um, you know, and, and that hopefully that's what some of those things like the parathyroid autofluorescence will help me not look like such a moron to my pathologist. Um, but uh, until then, I'm, I'm afraid we're still left, left with any patient that, that comes to me is stuck with John Russell doing his best. And sadly, that's not perfect. Jennifer, let me, um, uh, let me just see if you want to either field any questions that have come in or if you have any specific uh, questions you want to uh, bring up here. Um, I will admit I'm a little out of my element here because the majority of my uh, experience has to do with benign disease. Um, I've actually, I've, I've learned a lot during this con conversation and um, I'm, I'm just honored to be here. Um, I would just say that um, I think that I would like to know more about the ultrasound findings after RFA is done on a cancer. Um, are they similar to RFA on a benign nodule once it's been treated as far as the changes and how, when you're dealing with thyroid cancer, because you're looking for those suspicious features, how do you distinguish that between an RFA treated nodule? Great question. John? Great questions. Stay tuned. We'll give you answers at this panel, hopefully next year. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, I think really it's a, it's a work in process, right? Like, and that's why it's good to know that you should expect some growth of the cancer after you treat it with radiofrequency ablation. Um, lymph nodes certainly are concerning, and yet re some reactive lymph nodes after a procedure like that should be expected. Um, and, I, and I think really, again, go back to the team that you have, and I, and I would like to say experience, but I don't know that there's anybody that has that much experience in North America at this point that can really give you great answers. And so we'll, hopefully we will have some more and be able to answer those questions better. Mark, so, I, I was looking at the questions coming in. There were a couple that had a theme, but I, I go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm seeing, you know, oh, well, I've had this or that happen. I have a lymph node. I, my surgery wasn't too long ago, and I got radioactive iodine. I have several lymph nodes, or maybe uh, I am not radioactive responsive. I'm not having lymph nodes. Uh, what should be done and such? And I, I thought, you know, that we could you know, just share with, uh, you know, the, the people that are listening that one, I think, you know, if you just had surgery recently and you have more lymph nodes, I'm always as an endocrinologist curious, who did your surgery? Was it a high volume surgeon? And make sure that uh, if you have lymph nodes coming up, they could be recurrent, they could be persistent, meaning they were just missed. What kind of ultrasound and other imaging was done prior to your surgery and stuff. So I wouldn't necessarily be jumping to doing the ethanol ablation in somebody who's getting uh, lymph nodes popping up that early. I think we tend to hold that for further down the road. I won't say we never do, but uh, it depends on the situation. And then, you know, if you uh, larger lymph nodes, and if you're in the situation where radioiodine really isn't working and you've done a low iodine diet, done everything, I would say on those, yeah, it's a, it's a possibility that one of the things you might do is ethanol. I mean, I'm not impressed that radioiodine can deal with a lymph node bigger than five to six millimeters. And even at five to six millimeters, I'm not sure how well the job it does. So uh, I think uh, radioactive iodine is great for microscopic disease, very, very small stuff. And then after that, if you have recurrence in the neck, you're potentially need a surgeon or some type of other intervention. And again, in our place, we, we definitely use ethanol. Uh, and we also watch people. We do have people with active surveillance who have several lymph nodes that we know are positive. They're pretty small. Um, and we've just decided to watch. And I mean, I remember one lady was very nervous when I talked to her about that. And then uh, actually Mark, you'll ask this. She says, well, I watched a, an art, a, 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 a video by Dr. Tuttle. And he says, and I said, oh, I know Dr. Tuttle. So I called Mike Tuttle you up believe, and said- You can't believe that guy for anything. That's <laughs> a so, huge car of sales. I mean, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. But, but the part two of it is, uh, but then she said, okay. He says, it's fine to said, yeah. So we're all in agreement. So I've been, so she's about eight years out and she's stable and she's doing well. So the other thing is sometimes it's take our own pulse and say, you know, it's 
easy to jump and do something. We're not necessarily helping you live longer or a better life. We can potentially watch some small things very carefully and thoughtfully uh, and don't necessarily have to be doing intervention. So I just thought, cause I saw several ones that kind of fit in that uh, rubric of a question. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think the challenge with that um, is recurrent disease conjures up a different mindset um, for patients, I would imagine. And Jennifer, you can, obviously you can weigh in on this, but recurrent disease versus that de novo small micropapillary coming out of the box, um, out of, out of the gate. That's a it's different to watch one versus the other. I think. Um, let me just ask you, we've got a, a few minutes left here. I'm a patient and I've got um, what otherwise is a um, seemingly small recurrent, thi um, uh, well-differentiated um, thyroid cancer that's been biopsied in a lymph node. How do I, how do I as a patient choose um, between alcohol ablation? I want to get rid of this thing. I don't want to watch it grow. I'm not a can, I'm not fond of the idea of watching this lymph node. How do I choose between alcohol ablation versus radiofrequency ablation? Um, what, what in your mind would guide me? Obviously, all things being equal, getting somebody who's extremely skilled in both of those um, uh, types of intervention. But is there a way for a patient to navigate between those two options? Yeah, uh, it's a tough choice. I think, um, to me, the, the easiest answer is to just say, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And so the more options that a team has available, and it might not be a specific person that's offering all of the options, but just to have at their disposal all of the options, I think that way you can get the most, you can get the most personalized answer for you. And so if somebody has somebody that does ethanol, somebody does radio frequency, somebody does remote access, all of a sudden it's not about, well, we don't wanna lose your business, so you need to have radio frequency ablation or scarless surgery. Instead it becomes, you know, this is what I think is best for you. And it might not be the, the thing that you want, but at least you've got all the things on the table. Um, but all things being equal, um, which does the patient choose here? Um, do they choose to have alcohol or do they choose to have radio frequency ablation? Vic, do you, obviously your experience is largely with alcohol. Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, we've got, we're, we're up against the final minute here. I think the, the biggest thing is in talking to my team about this and my interventional radiologist as we're starting to do benign nodules with RFA and laser and such as having the importance of having, doing this safely and having clearance and making sure that you don't cause thermal damage. And if you're in the middle of a, a benign thyroid nodule or in a lobe with a microcarcinoma, uh, I think you have a lot of clearance. You get into lymph nodes and you don't have a lot of clearance. And so I think that's always something where with the ethanol, yes, you have to worry about it dribbling out, but uh, you don't have the heat you know, coming off from it. So that's one issue, but I'm open to it. And I think, you know, we try to uh, present our patients that have challenging issues at our thyroid tumor board that has a multidisciplinary attendance and then come up with answers. And then I'm blessed to know a lot of people uh, that are in, practicing in the United States and abroad and doing different things. And if somebody really is interested in something, I'll point them in the right direction uh, because that's part of what I think we should be doing. Absolutely. Listen, um, everybody, I want to thank everybody who's in attendance and in particular, um, thank our three panelists for, um, uh, for great presentations, great uh, discussion here, um, and uh, um, look forward to everybody enjoying the rest of the meeting. The hats off to Gary Bloom and uh, the team at uh, Thyca. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.